In this video, I'm going to give you a psychological definition of what personality is, and we're going to talk about a system you can use to assess the quality of any personality theory. So first of all, there's a difference between everyday understandings of personality and the psychological understandings of personality. And in everyday language, we might say, who is Oprah? Oh, she is gorgeous, she is super rich, she has a media empire, she interviews people really well, she's been working for herself for decades, you know, things of that nature that describe these physical appearance and social styles and job situations. We might even go into something like what we think the character is, how nice they are, how shy they are, for example. The psychological definition of what personality is. According to Gordon Allport, 1961, personality is a dynamic organization inside the person of psychophysical systems that create the person's characteristic patterns of behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. So this is a very dense definition. In other words, dynamic means that it's active and evolving, but around an internal sort of structure and pattern means that these thoughts and behaviors and feelings are somewhat stable, maybe even typical, maybe even predictable. Because psychology is the scientific study of behavior, psychologists look for measurable and quantifiable ways to pinpoint motivation, categorize behaviors, and then measure how they develop and also pinpoint maybe some predictability. This allows them to measure progress and also create statistical norms according to which a developmental progress can be measured. They also differentiate between healthy and unhealthy variations of that personality. We see that especially for children, you've maybe heard that your daughter, congratulations, she is in the 90th percentile of this cognitive ability test. So this is creating benchmarks of what individuals should be able to do by a certain age. Many people have come up with different theories about personality, so psychologists have also devised an eight-point system by which you can assess the quality of that theory. And I'm going to list the eight points here, and then we're going to go into Jung's personality to see how it stacks up. From the title of this video, you already know that Jung apparently only ticks two of these boxes, so to make sure that we're all on the same page, let's go through a quick refresher of what his theory of personality actually says. He posits that your psyche contains different structures. Your ego is the center of your consciousness. Your personal unconscious is the stuff that you suppress, that you don't want to think about. And then the collective unconscious is a term that he coined because he believes it's innately human since he observed and saw that people all over the world have very similar dream symbols. And Part of these dream symbols, for example, he called the archetypes. These archetypes include the persona. Persona literally means mask, so it refers to the role that we assume in order to deal with the world. Our shadow, which is, again, the stuff that we suppress. And then the anima is the feminine element in a male psyche, or the animus, which is the male element in a feminine psyche. And the self, according to Jung, is this potential that we have inside us, like this becoming of who we really are and who we were always meant to be, which, according to Jung, happens basically around midlife when we go through this process that he called individuation. And that is the theory in very broad strokes. The types that I have mentioned in other videos here, those are the different categories of consciousness that Jung refers to, the functions, how we use our brain, the dominant type, for example, extroverted thinking, introverted sensing. I have other videos about those dominant function types. And so, for example, if extroverted feeling is your dominant function, your ego, then introverted thinking, the opposite would be your anima or animus, because that's the inferior function. And Jung's theory is very much about the tension of opposites and how to bring a balance to the psyche. Jung also describes maladaptive developments of personality, basically when somebody is overusing the one dominant function and repress all the other psychic content into the shadow, he calls that a complex. Like the shadow is going to bubble up as a complex. For example, if a man doesn't 
integrate the anima, the feminine element of his psyche into consciousness, then this man might become super chauvinistic and lack empathy and that is going to come out as a complex that is going to affect the personal relationships he has. Now that we have a broad overview of Jung's personality theory, here are now the eight categories how to assess the quality of any theory. The first one, psychologists say that Jung's theory does not describe how personality actually develops in enough detail. They call his references obscure and say that the archetypes are too mystical. Psychologists also say that Jung's concepts of persona and shadow are useful, but that they don't explain why certain behaviors occur. Jung also believed in synchronicity, meaning that two things can happen without causing one another and still have a meaningful relationship to one another, which again is too mystical for the hard science that psychology wants to be. Psychologists also say his theory is difficult to test. The questionnaires that we're maybe familiar with and the typing self-discovery processes that I do, they only go to the types, not the personality theory as a whole, which means its empirical validity is considered low. Likewise, the types like extraversion and introversion can be measured, but it's impossible to pinpoint a shadow on an EEG, which means testable concepts for this theory are considered low as well. And psychologists also agree that is that his theory is comprehensive and that it incorporates a lot of ground, including some ancient Indian philosophies as well, but they do lament that it's a bit superficial. Psychologists say his theory is not parsimonious because it is unclear how the structures relate to the actual resulting observable behavior. It also doesn't explain which structure might be more influential than others. And now we get to the two check marks. Jung's theory has influenced many other disciplines and he has posed some big questions for mankind's development, which means the theory has heuristic value and the theory also has applied value because there are many therapists who train in Jungian analytics. The concepts of extraversion and introversion have been incorporated into the theories of other psychologists. The concept of self and Jung's positive spin on human nature and development has been taken on by many others. Not to mention he was the first to introduce art therapy and help develop Alcoholics Anonymous, for example. So the applied value of people actually using his therapy is indeed very high. So here's why those six check marks he didn't get surprised me. Until I studied my master's in psychology, I didn't realize that psychology sees itself as a hard science, like physics. So the history of psychology basically is it comes out of philosophy. And then around the time when people developed microscopes and the enlightenment and everything became a lot more mechanistic and the industrial revolution and people wanted to be more laws of gravity that people hadn't really realized so now you can measure all these things. I understand when it comes to human behavior, you want to be able to be objective and make sure that you get it right and make sure that you're taken seriously by these people in the other lab coats. And that's why Wilhelm Wundt in 1879, when he opened his first lab in Leipzig, it was a big deal and it is a big deal and it's amazing. My concern is that the hard sciences are literally about laws and immutable objects where psychology is literally about subjective human individuals who are so complex and dynamic systems within systems that maybe one law or things that you can count are not going to answer all the questions. If we even look at the nature v nurture debate that used to be very prominent, that's been replaced now by the biopsychosocial model so biopsychosocial, our behavior is dictated by so many different variables that maybe the psychological piece is only going to explain 30% or so because the rest is biology and then there's also that cultural and the societal and the contextual aspects of it. Which is why I, when I work with my clients, I tell them type explains a lot, but type doesn't explain everything. We want to hold all of these models quite lightly. And there we are. So tell me, what do you think? Do you think we have a shadow? Do you believe in archetypes? Or do you think that our behavior is completely deterministic and that it's basically a long string of cause and effect? 
let me know in the comments. I'll see you in the next one.